So I'm going to go ahead and get started with what's new in 2017. First, I'll give you just a tiny bit about myself. Uh, my name is Marcus Brown. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I got my degree from Oklahoma State University, and I still live here in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, I've been an applications engineer since 2008, but I started using SolidWorks in 2003, I believe. And um, I've got certifications on every major product in the SolidWorks uh, family, so uh, we have a lot of stuff to show you. So let's we'll jump right into the action and see what we can look at. So this is the 2017 interface. If you haven't seen it, it's going to look a lot like the 2016 interface. Um, for instance, the icons uh, kind of have that new look where they scale with the interface. So if you have a 4K or 5K display with a very high resolution, you'll be able to scale up those icons really nicely. Uh, also, the color has been brought back. So if you're in Service Pack 4 of 2016, 2017 is going to look very similar. There's some new enhancements in the interface uh, starting last year and continuing this year for things like breadcrumbs. So if I come in and I click on a part, let's say I click on this part right here, uh, I can take a look at the kind of the critical path up here, these breadcrumbs at the top left. And that's the assembly, subassembly part, body, feature, face, and sketch that represents that geometry. Now included this year is some additional things such as if I look at a part, I can see if there's any mates that are, that are uh, failing on there, and I can just click directly on that mate. Not only will it immediately tell me what's wrong, it also gives me the action item to fix it. So I don't have to think about, is it a sketch or is it a feature problem? Click the button on the action item after it tells you what's wrong. This one is just missing a face, so I will finish that out and then click OK. Now you can speed this up a little bit by hitting the D key. The D key will bring you the OK button. It'll bring you the exit sketch button. It'll also bring you those breadcrumbs. So when I hit my D key, I can see the breadcrumbs, and I can take a look and see what's going on. Uh, it looks like I have a, a rebuild error on one of my parts. So what I'm going to do is open up that assembly. You see here's the, uh, the, the features that are giving me a problem. Actually, I'm going to open up the part, and we'll take a look at it. Now this one has quite a few features on it, um, but specifically I've left some sketches and some planes visible. Now with those visibility, that helps you to work, but occasionally then they get all up in the way, and you've got to go through and start hiding all the various types of things that are on here. By clicking this button, this I, up here at the top in your heads-up display, you can quickly hide all types. It immediately hides everything. You don't have to go looking through a menu to find that hide all types button. Plus, you click it again, it brings it all back. I've been using that quite a bit throughout my uh, uh, use of 2017 so far. We're seeing some rebuild errors in the feature tree. So if I come over here and I click on the feature, again, just like in the context menu or just like in the breadcrumbs, you'll see exactly what's wrong. You don't even have to ask it. Click the action item to get it fixed, and you can very quickly see what's wrong, repair the error. This one's just missing an, an axis, and you're back in business. Now, as you make these changes and you look around, you can see the parent-child relationships are now displayed this year in a little bit different format than they were last year. It's a little bit cleaner. It doesn't look like the fireworks display like it did last time. Uh, it does a really nice job of keeping it clean, showing you where you are in the feature tree, what parent-child relations you have. Uh, for this fillet, it looks like we're missing some features, so I'll go in and edit that feature, and I need to reselect these edges. Now, one of the things that I've loved forever about SolidWorks and the fillet command is that when you click one edge, it plays this seven questions game to try to guess all the other edges that might be included in the selection set you're going for. That's a very powerful tool, but every once in a while, the next icon or the next edge you're trying to pick is directly underneath this dialog. Click little red X, closes that selection toolbar, and now it won't come up anymore. So that really nice feature, which could get in the way a couple percent of the time, can be suppressed completely. If you want to turn it back on, just come over here and check the box to say Show Selection Toolbar. It comes right back up the next time you use it, and you're back in business. So a really customizable interface and working with uh, these features and functions. Just a lot of depth of functionality this year. Jumping back up into the main assembly, got a few other things I want to try. So, uh, for instance, on uh, this part right here, this is a screw, and I've got a lot of different sizes of screws. But like many fasteners, I've got one size of fastener, 
it's like in this case this uh, this M4 screw that I always use by default. It's my main one. It's the one that's that I've got a barrel full out on the shop floor. It's the one I'd prefer everybody use first and foremost. So by coming into the part and opening it up, you'll see that the one I use is way down here buried. It's not very easy to see. It's now possible to go in and choose how you want your order to be displayed on your configurations. That can be history-based, numerical, or my preference here is going to be manual drag and drop. And what I'm going to do is just take all of my main standard fasteners, my two and a half, three, and my four sizes. Those will be the top ones. Now I can very quickly get to those without having to do a lot of searching around to try to find it. And when I jump back into the assembly and I go look at my list, there is my preferred M4 screw, making it easy to grab it and continue working on. Little things like that are just going to help out tremendously in the, with, with the speed. Um, this design is a pretty big one. This is a, a, a myoelectric uh, uh, device. So if you have partial paralysis in your arm, this kind of creates a power steering situation where it gathers your nerve uh, uh, movements and supplements your movement and your strength of your muscles with motors and gearboxes. Now, because I have so many people working on this, I need to make sure we communicate clearly. And one of the ways that I do that is with comment indicators. So if I come over here and take a look at the tree display, just right click at the top of the tree, there's a tree display, and there's several new options in this area. One of them is this comment indicator. So I'll say show comment indicators, and you'll see what it looks like, little post-it notes. And I don't know about you guys, but I use post-it notes around the office or around the house to say, hey, don't forget this, or you know, buy peanut butter, whatever the thing is that I'm trying to communicate to other people, or try to be communicated from. So these items, if I just hover over it, it shows me what the comment is and who wrote it. And in fact, there's a whole comments folder where all the comments are, are grouped together at the top level of the assembly. And you can see it's applied to assemblies, mates, folders, just about anything and everything you would want to do, you can actually create this nice post-it note for and communicate. I'm going to create one more. And this comment has to do with the color scheme. See this blue color on this motor? Uh, we've decided to, to, to narrow down the color options to just a handful of different colors. And so I'm going to grab the image file that represents the color options we've decided on. It's this yellow, green, and blue. The project and understand exactly what we're doing. It's been maybe requested or noted. So you're basically done the best job of keeping a nice journal of all of our, our work. This allows you to keep it right where it's important and right where it's useful. Speaking of those color options, so the the colors, in this case, are being applied using decals. And these decals, I'd like to be able to hide or show the decals based on the colors. Um, there's also going to be some customization involved. And so uh, what I'd like to be able to do is just use display states to hide and show those decals. And that's possible in 2017. Simply choose which display state you want to use, and it very quickly will apply it. All right, looks like we were having a bit of audio problems, but it looks like it came back. So hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody can still hear me. Keep me updated if anything changes, and we'll we'll circle back around. Uh, I want to make a change to one of these parts right here, and specifically, what I want to do is I want to work on adding a sketched feature, and this sketched feature is going to represent a really cool uh, uh, capability in the sketching environment. I'm going to start a new sketch, and the first thing I'm going to do is just add a sketch entity. And I don't know if you remember this, but when you right-click in a sketch to see what entities you have, you might fill your whole screen. And if your resolution isn't super high or your text size is really big, it would probably take up the entire screen. Well, they've done a nice grid organization pattern now, making it a lot easier to get to all your commands in that right-click menu. In this case, I want to do a slot, 
And when I draw this slot out, there's nothing really fancy or new about how the slot is created, but notice that once I finish creating that slot, this slot is now shaded. And look at this, I grab this shaded uh, uh, profile and move it around and it's not going to scale. So normally you would grab an edge and that edge would make the, the, the sketch bigger or smaller, right? But this underdefined item, almost like a block, can be manipulated and moved anywhere I want. If I create another closed profile, such as a profile inside of a profile, it creates a grady, grady, gradient uh, uh, shading so that you can tell which one is closed. So what this is really going to help with is as you're building your sketches and as you're building your features, you won't suddenly be surprised that you forgot to fully close in or that you've missed some tiny edge. The other thing is you can actually run uh, commands on that shaded region. So if I want to do an offset entities on that shaded region, simply specify the value of the offset that I want, and it doesn't require that I pick all the lines and arcs, it just grabs that contour. Now, this contour selection, or this contour uh, uh, shading uh, feature kind of fits in nicely and naturally with the contour select tool. Now, the contour select tool was always available in the right-click menu, but now if you hold down your Alt key, you can actually pick a contour right here in the sketch. And if you notice, I'm not even in a feature. I'm just selecting the contours in the sketch so that when I do execute the feature, it grabs the contours that I wanted. So if you can kind of tell, if you have a bunch of overlapping regions, you would execute the command and then pick the profiles. I'm doing this backwards by holding on the Alt key to select and pre-select the contours that I'm interested in. It's pretty nice. So I'm going to jump back over to the main assembly. And in this main assembly, I have a few other things that I want to work on here in this wrist area. So there's that, uh, that plate that I just finished working on. Uh, and I need to make a change inside of one of these pieces. So I'm going to open up the subassembly. So I hit my D key to bring my breadcrumbs down to my cursor. That way I don't have to move my mouse around. And I can find the subassembly that I'm looking for. And right here you can see standard planes, which is useful for adding mates to that subassembly. I can see the mates that are applied, but I can also execute the command of opening that subassembly. Super quick and easy. Now the part that I need to make a change to actually lives inside this gearbox. And so I'm going to do a section view, but I don't know about you guys, but every now and again, I do a section view, and as I go deeper and deeper, you kind of lose track of where you are. Where in the world am I, and what's going on around this section plane? Uh, because I've sectioned away so much information, it's very difficult to see. So in 2017, we've introduced this transparency selection. What it allows you to do is just grab one or more components and just choose for them to go wireframe when they're behind the section. It really gives you a lot of, of uh, clarity into what's going on. And so now you can see what's going on. You can see the section. But I can also get in and look at the part that I'm interested in, in applying a change to. So this is the part that I'm going to work on. This part is an insert. It's a, it's a threaded insert. And we're going to 3D print it on one of our 3D Systems metal printers. And so and for that reason, I'm going to add threads to it. I wouldn't always add threads. I might just call them out and throw them on the drawing. But in this case, uh, the full three, 3D threads are going to be useful. So I'll use the thread command. I don't have to worry about going out and creating a helix or anything like that. Simply specify where I want my thread to start. Specify how I want it to offset or if I want it to offset. In this case, I'm going to offset up a little bit. And what this means is it's going to start a little higher than the top. That way I don't have to worry about that lead in or having some kind of a blank stopping point. But because I've offset it up to the top, I have an option down here to just trim it with the start face. And so you can see if I turn that off, the thread starts way up high. If I turn it off, uh, it starts a lot lower. And most of these commands, just like we're used to, right, they, these commands are all just going to very quickly 
um, you'll be able to kind of go through and, and quickly discover all the various different features that you need to get it looking how you like it. So that looks really nice. Uh, I've got a nice wide thread so that it threads quickly, a nice long pitch, but I'm going to do a multi-start so that I have two threads going around this thing. So I've got it trimmed to the start face, and I've got a multi-start. So if I click OK, it tells me, oh, can't cut it. This is an extruded thread. I, I, I just missed that one box. But it does a nice job of helping me to see what needs to be done. So that thread, one quick feature, and I'm off to the races. I do want to worry about this lead out here. And with the lead out, what I've done is I've pre-created a sketch, just a nice arc here. And, and I just created a layout sketch to kind of uh, uh, detail how I wanted that lead out to go. But what I want the shape to be is whatever the profile ended up on that thread profile. Now normally I would create a sketch, I would convert the edges, I would then use that sketch to create the sweep. Well, 2017, we don't have to do that. Click that face, click that edge, click that sketch entity, whatever it is, you're going to see that it does a very nice job of just taking it and going. So a lot less time is going to be spent building sketches just to recreate the existing geometry that already is there in your model. The next thing I want to do is create a pattern. Now for this pattern, let me go to the front here. For this pattern, I've created my first seed feature right in the middle of where I want it to be. And I want to do a circular pattern around this part. And if I go one direction, you can see I get the one direction no problem. But now it's the question of how do I do the other direction? Well, I can do two directions now inside of a circular pattern. Specify your gap or your angle and your quantity, or you can do equal spacing on either side. But there is also one additional option that allows you to do symmetric if you want to do a symmetric spacing. Keep an eye on that one. In uh, some of the pre-releases, it was a little bit interesting, but uh, the, the symmetric option is going to be very helpful for you doing symmetry patterns in a circular way. Uh, the thread feature is available in all versions of SOLIDWORKS. In fact, it is also available in 2016 SOLIDWORKS. Let's take a look one more time at this subassembly, because I've, I've got that feature created. I've got that insert going. But now what I want to do is clean up this part. This part, this is a housing. It's right down there by the end user's wrist. And so there's going to be a lot of banging, uh, potentially getting this thing hit a little bit. And I don't want it to, to, to knock these sharp edges off. So I'm going to use the chamfer tool in order to uh, build these chamfers on this edge. Now, the chamfer used to always be kind of the, uh, the little brother of the fillet tool. The fillet tool was so powerful. You can do face fillets, blended fillets, multi-radius fillets. The chamfer in 2017 does all of those things. So let's say that I go in here and I want to create a fillet on this edge. I can just type in my size and grab that edge. But what if I want to do multiple sizes of fillet or chamfers in one item? I can turn on the multi-distance chamfer option and come through here and start picking up each of these edges. And each one has a flag where I can modify the value of that fillet or that chamfer. Uh, if I come over here and I specify the size I want, it will allow all the new sizes to be that new size. But see how quickly I can go through and build all my chamfers on all these edges. And I click OK. And I've only got one feature in the tree to worry about. Because all I'm really doing is knocking these corners off in various sizes. Now let's take that one step further. I've got this shape up here. And I've got some, some split lines to define where I want this really nice, sexy chamfer to be. And I want to create that chamfer where it kind of blends and follows those guide curves. Well, in a fillet, that would be a face fillet. So in a chamfer, we're going to use the face chamfer. And I'm going to use a hold line to specify where I want this to hold. And what it does is it just kind of creates basically a swept cut 
or a lofted surface to cut through and create this nice blending chamfer all the way around. Now, I did make a, a mistake. I, I created the chamfer down here at the bottom, and what I should have done is do it before the shell. So what I'm going to do is just drag it up above the shell, and now it does a nice job of creating that chamfer and then doing the shell and all my features. As we expect in SolidWorks, all my downstream features are all intact and ready to go. But just about the moment you think you got it done, just about the moment you think you've got your feature just exactly the way you want it, somebody says, hey, you know, chamfers, they're not bad. I prefer it was a fillet, though. What would it look like if it was a fillet? Now, I don't want to have to go through and redo this whole thing. I don't want to get rid of my chamfer and put in a fillet instead. So 2017 has included the ability to take any chamfer and turn it into a fillet, or any fillet and change it over to a chamfer. Now, how cool is that? You have full control. Chamfer and fillet are now basically interchangeable, identical type features. All the commands that you're used to inside of a fillet are going to apply to the chamfer, giving you full control over building the part just exactly the way you want it. I love the features in the new chamfer capabilities. I'm going to go and do one more thing to this assembly. And it involves this plate right here. Now, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to do and why, because it's very important. And it's also a big theme in 2017 this year. Sometimes I have a part that has no features. No features because maybe it came from uh, an AutoCAD sketch, or it came as a step file, or it came as a, a, a file format from another program. And I want to have features. That's very common. But it's also common the other way around, where I have a bunch of features, and I don't want those features any longer, either because I don't want people to modify them, or because I don't want the intellectual property of the feature creation to be shared with the people that I'm sharing the files. So whatever your reason is, rebuild time, file size, you name it, we want to have full control over how intelligent our features and our parts are. So check this out. This guy has some sketches. And it has some axes and some other reference geometry that was used to build the features. And what I want to do is keep that stuff for reference, but I want to lock down the design. I want to make it impossible for anyone to change this part. I've just bought an expensive tool, and I don't want anybody thinking that they can make a change to this geometry. Right click at the top of the feature tree, convert to bodies. This is going to convert this feature-based intelligent model into a dumb body. You have to do a control cube beforehand. So I'll hit save, and then I'm just going to say uh, body only. I'm just going to save it kind of as a new part. But I'm going to tell it to preserve the geometry references, sketches. So anything that uh, was created there for reference will still come over in the, the final model. So here's my copied one. And if you see, it has all the sketches and all the information that's available. But look at my feature. My feature is just a converted body. It's effectively an imported body. It's a dumb solid, and it cannot be modified at this point. So you have full control over this. Now, here's the even better part. When I click back over to my main assembly, this is the new part. This new feature, this converted feature, is just inserted into my assembly all my mates, all my drawings, all of everything that I want. Let's see if I have a drawing for this guy. Everything that I need is here, and it's still intact, including balloons, bills of materials, you name it. So pretty powerful functionality. I'm going to go back to my main assembly. I've got a few more things I want to do to this one. Uh, one of them is, you know, we're, we're kind of, this is kind of a personal thing, right? This is going to be a part of this person's arm. And so what I want to do is give him the ability to customize it. We'll also want to add some marketing information to it. So I'm going to create a wrap on this wrist cuff. Now the wrap is just, in our case, is just going to have the logo of the company name wrapped around this wrist. 
but this is not cylindrical. This is not conical. Uh, and so what I'll do is just say, let's do this wrap. Use my feature search here to get the wrap tool. And normally you would use a, an analytical method to wrap it. So you get a perfect wrap around a cone or a cylinder. Well, this now gives me the ability to do it across the spline surface. And for those of you who haven't seen the flatten surface functionality in SolidWorks, this is the opposite of the surface flatten. So instead of taking a complex shape and flattening it out, it's taking a flat shape and then forming it over top of this complex geometry. Now when I click OK, it's going to represent the most accurate possible uh, deformation of this logo on this surface as it goes. And it's not just like a split line, where a split line would just sort of project it straight down. Um, in fact, if I was to move this up almost all the way up here to where it's hanging off the part, at that point, it will go down, make contact, wrap it around, and I'll take a look, and you'll see that it didn't fall off the side of the part. It wrapped it around, and it reproduced very clearly and very accurately the shape of that logo. So the wrap feature is going to be very powerful for uh, handling whatever crazy shape you've got in order to, to create your labels and apply your geometry. One other change I want to make to this uh, finger piece here. Uh, this, this guy, actually, let me show you real quick. This is going to be on their finger every time they wear this. And the first thing I thought of was, this is going to start to itch. right? You got your two fingers smashed together there uh, inside this cuff. I'm going to probably have like a pencil or something like that to sit there and itch my fingers. But uh, I want to create a little window here so that I can itch my fingers, but also so that it reduces some weight. Um, and I want to make sure that the thickness around here is constant all the way. Now, just like that wrap feature, though, I don't want it to be a projected vertical distance. I want it to be a true distance uh, back from that surface, kind of as the, the shape of this carbon fiber is done. So in my sketch commands in 2017 is a command called offset on surface. Now, offset on surface does an offset, but unlike a sketch offset in 2D, where it's just measuring through the plane or along the plane, this is actually measuring along the surface. So you can have it measure around the circumference of a cylinder, for instance. Here's my distance from this edge following this face here. I can reverse that edge, or if I was to grab more than one edge, it would just go all the way around and offset it all along that face. Now, for this, I'm just going to go ahead and grab this entire top face and just create a window right in the middle that's going to represent where I want it to be. And now no matter what the curvature does, I know that there's going to be 7 millimeters of flat distance in this finished curved part. Do a nice little trim here to clean that up and empty out that middle piece. Just remove that. And then when we roll back to the end, you'll see that it's going to be a very nice open window in that part, but all my geometry and information is still maintained. I'll add a quick fillet, and if you guys remember, that selection toolbar that popped up, the one that pops up and says, hey, what are the other edges you're probably going to grab? That item, I turned it back on, so when I come over here and I click my first edge, it's going to grab the other four, giving me all five edges that I want without me having to go around and select them information and automation when you want it, but you can get it out of the way when you don't. And we're getting pretty close on this, uh, this assembly here. For the most part, I think I've handled uh, a lot of the design aspect of it. I'd like to take you through a few other uh, features and functions that are available inside SolidWorks and kind of show you what all else we can do. The advanced whole feature what it allows me to do is create kind of a whole wizard on steroids. And we're looking, this might end up being kind of the future of holes and whole wizards. And what it allows you to do is specify a very complicated, almost stack. I'd like it to go all the way through. So instead of just choosing where the top of that hole is, 
you can actually tell it where the bottom of the hole is too, and you can create cuts from both ends of this hole. So for this hole, I'll give it a through hole size, and then I'm going to start adding additional features to the end of this feature. So for instance, I have a threaded far side tapered tap. Specify my size, and it's just going to add it to that stack of features. I'll add one more element below that one, and we'll do it as a whole. You could also do this as a counter bore, uh, counter sink, just about anything you'd like to do. This one just needs to be a real shallow one, it's just a, a face off that piece. And now when I click OK, you'll see this whole feature gets created and it's all stored. Let me zoom in out here so you can see it. It's all stored in one feature in the tree. Now, let's take that a step further it's very possible that I need five of these. Well, because I did them all as one feature, I can simply choose five holes. We'll take it another step further. Let's say that this stack of cuts is a fairly standard stack of cuts. It's got two specific hydraulic ports, threaded ports on each end. I can save this as a favorite. And I've actually created a couple of favorites already that I can go and pull. So anytime I need to make a manifold like this, it's going to be very simple for me to just choose which uh, uh, type of ports I need on each end, and then I can quickly apply that and go. So very, very powerful functionality for creating these complicated holes. Effectively, it's a stack, an entire stack of hole wizard features, one on top of the other. We also have uh, a couple quick features inside of sheet metal. So if you guys have ever seen the sheet metal functionality where you can do a kind of a pipe intersecting at a really weird angle, what SolidWorks is doing is it's taking that shape on the top and projecting it onto the sheet metal so that on the top it grabs this back edge, but then on the bottom it grabs the front edge. And so you can see that the, the minimum condition of the smallest uh, piece of that cut is the area where the cut is limited. So that, sh that circle creates kind of an oval shape. The only problem is, and this is a, it's a minor thing, it's never really caused major issues, but that projected shape will sometimes leave just a tiny little piece left over in the corner. Now it's a minor thing, but what they've done is they've added this new checkbox called Optimized Geometry. It's on by default, so all of your new features are going to have this any old features, simply go and, and check that box on the normal cut option, optimize the geometry, and it's going to clean that out. Very much how sheet metal uh, corners and sheet metal bend regions are straightened out and cleaned up to make it easier to cut your flat pattern. SolidWorks normal cut is cleaning up your sheet metal uh, and just giving you uh, what is effectively going to now be a perfect no interference uh, cut. Also inside sheet metal, a lot of times we'll have situations where, depending on how you built it, whether you did it as a convert or whether you did it as a um, uh, just edge flanges or maybe a miter flange, you end up with situations where you have three bends all coming together at a single corner. And the corner, in many cases, has to be a very certain size or shape. So some people have circles, some people do bend waste. Um, SolidWorks Corner Relief Command now allows you to do two corner and three corner bends. And you just choose the shape, so you can do a circular, rectangular, a tear, uh, anything like that, and it just takes that shape, whatever it was prior to the corner relief. So here it is after the edge flange. Simply apply that corner relief feature and it cleans it up. When you go to the drawing, you'll see the flat pattern that we've got. I'll just kind of quickly preview the flat pattern and I love looking at the flat pattern because it shows you very clearly all the different shapes that are available. So this part, every last edge was made the same but when we get into the flat pattern you'll see that the 3D model and the flat pattern both represent this accurate corner treatment. So we've got rectangular, we've got tear, we've got aub round, very easy to work with and get just exactly the result you want but not only in the 2D, but also in the 3D geometry. So 
So there's a new feature, and, and this is something you guys will probably notice. I know I've def definitely noticed it, that as new features come out, brand new features come out each year, the very next year you tend to see three or four just super cool things added to it. They just take it to that next level. Somebody out there saw this function and said, you know what this needs? One more thing. And the thing I'm going to show you here is this make controller feature. So if you didn't see it last year, the make controller allows you to take distance and angle mates and use those as basically motors, linear motors and, and, and uh, rotary motors. And you can then drive them to drive the movement. And it captures the various positions of the part. And so this is probably going to look terrible across this webinar, but I am animating a pick and place robot. And it's going in and kind of picking up and dropping off these different components. And it's all being performed by simply driving the mate locations or the mate values. Now, I've created some named positions here. So if I want to go to the home position, for instance, it takes me to where I call it home. Well, somebody said, well, why can't we just add a configuration called home at that position? That way I can use it in my drawing. So with one click, it adds a configuration called home. And I'm going to add a few more positions here. Again, so that I can use this in an alternate position view or so that I can uh, uh, maybe just show different constraints or positions uh, in maybe a larger assembly. So if I open up my drawing, you'll see here I want to just show the range of emotion that we can expect when this, is, this robot is in full operation. So because I now have make controller configurations, they're even labeled make controller pickup and make controller home, I can now show that full range of motion very quickly and easily, and it's being generated and controlled by that make controller feature. So I've been using the make controller for a lot of my, my robots and, and kind of automation stuff. Let's take a look at some simulation. Now with simulation, we've seen some improvements in um, speed and performance. And we see that every year. But there's a handful of things that I absolutely love this year uh, that, that really speed things up. So for instance, one of the big ones, and if I turn on my simulation add-in, you'll see I have a new display type. And it's called simulation display. Effectively, what it says is this view right here where I've got all my, my um, uh, appearances and decals and I've got real view turned on, I'd like to be able to see my simulation display in this view so that I can communicate to everybody else in the company, maybe people that don't have um, uh, the ability to go into the studies and actually look. So by turning on the stress result, I can see what the stress plot shows on this part. Pretty cool, right? I can even do like a deformed result. I can show the mesh. Uh, I can get this to look just exactly the way I want it, even change the, uh, the transparency or the shininess. Uh, um, what's that word? <laughs> and uh, it gives you a really good understanding of what's going on with the stresses. Now, to take this one step further, if you have a 3D printer that prints in full color, uh, and, and there's several of them out there that do now, you can actually take this and export it and print it in 3D. Now imagine being able to show somebody the thermal distribution or the stress distribution or the, the you know, deformation caused by the loading or the plastic injection molding process to be able to actually build that in 3D and let them look at it, visually understand it on the part. So some pretty amazing capabilities there. I'm going to open this guy up because it's, it's also got, besides just being pulled on, which is what I did there, I did a kind of a grab it and pull it too hard, I also need to show this tab being pushed in so that it can be inserted. Because when it's first inserted, uh, we need to kind of bend it backwards to make sure it doesn't break. So I've created a configuration specifically for this particular tab being bent back. And 
if I go through and I set up the mesh and I run it, occasionally you'll get messages. Now, a mesh solve in this case is just a handful of seconds, but these messages could come up, let's say I walk away and I go get coffee, I come back and the message is still there waiting for me. It hasn't done any work in the amount of time that I've been gone. Well, in this case, I let it run and it actually threw up a message and said, hey, I want you to address this question. This question happened to be large displacement. Do you want to solve with large displacement? That's a great question. It's a very relevant question. The problem is I don't care I'm getting coffee, right? So what this decision solver does, and it's turned on in the simulation options, the decision solver says, you know what, I'll give you this much time. I'll even show you what it looks like in the settings. I'll give you, and I set mine to seven seconds, to decide for yourself what you want. Now, if you either don't care, aren't paying attention, or aren't even at your computer, after seven seconds, I'll answer it. The software will make the best decision for the question that comes up, and then at the end of it, it will display what decisions were made in your absence. I mean, it's like the perfect intern. You don't have to feed them or anything, but they sit there and do work for you while you're gone. And it does a really nice job of making good decisions and communicating that information to you once you come back. Now, the, the stresses look like they're pretty high here. I'd like to change my plot. So the plot constraints, you can now click on the numbers on your chart and just directly change those values right here. In fact, you can also tell it to create a maximum or a minimum annotation. Uh, you can do a probe from right here. You can reset the colors. You can even change the color to be a different color entirely, just to be a really nice illustration of the stress state. Now this one appears to have some stress concentrations. I have a sharp internal corner here. And normally I would clean up that sharp internal corner, but in the case of uh, this part, I just wanted to run a really quick study just to get an understanding of the general strength. So now I want to see how bad the stress hotspots are caused by that stress singularity. There's a new stress hotspot diagnostics command. It allows you to specify what sensitivity you want to use, and when you choose that sensitivity, it then narrows down what probability or how much of a singularity you have based on the size of your mesh. In fact, I can even isolate the elements where that's a problem, and you can see here in these sharp internal corners, in bending, which is exactly the location you would expect to see those stress singularities, you see which elements specifically are causing the problem. I can match that up with my areas of highest stress to understand whether I have any major concerns for this part. Now, I've run the study, I've gotten some results, I've checked for the stress hotspot, but I did get a large displacement message, and I'd like to run it uh, in this, um, I'd like to run it in a, as a nonlinear study, because I want to make sure that the static study and the nonlinear study are going to be the same. Normally what I would do is create a new study, and copy over, just drag and drop the bodies, the fixtures, the connections, the mesh, uh, the loads, everything that I have in this study, just make, make a copy of it in the new study. Well, there's a new capability that allows me to duplicate this study, so it's just called copy study, just right click on the study and copy it, but you get to choose what type of study you're going to create. So a linear study, static study, can be converted to a nonlinear or a dynamic or even a nonlinear dynamic study, taking the accuracy level much, much higher retaining exactly the settings that I started with. If I go into a nonlinear study, you may think, okay, well, there's a lot of stuff that you have to know to do a nonlinear study. And that's somewhat true, but they're making it easier and easier all the time. They've automatically set all the curves for me, and in this case, they automatically solved or chose the solver. So you're not worried about which solver should be used for this type or this size of study. And if you end up running this study and you want to see, okay, well, is that result uh, comparable to you know, one of these other ones? Uh, let's say I want to compare the, the linear with the nonlinear. It's possible to do a comparison across multiple studies. 
and match up those those plots to look the same. And so I can say, okay, yeah, that's that's looking good, or no, that's not looking good, or those results uh, look very different. You can see that they they rotate in unison automatically. Now we're still having an issue with the charts being matched up correctly on the uh, the color charts. So keep an eye on that. But that comparison tool is very powerful for being able to to look at two different types of of studies and make sure the results are relevant between the two. Let's keep on moving. I got a bunch of other things I want to talk about. So uh, one of the big ones this year is a brand new feature, and it's kind of it's kind of one of those blow your mind kind of features, and it's called 3D interconnect. That's the name of the capability that they've introduced. 3D interconnect is a um, is a tool specifically designed for people that are having uh, to import models from another package. So for instance, how many of you guys have uh, a, a customer or a, a, a supplier or somebody that is using ProE or that is using um, maybe NX or Inventor or uh, who knows, right? Now that, that file, when you bring it in, it gets converted. Well, 3D Interconnect, the idea is, Let's not convert it anymore. Why do we convert these things? Why do we convert IGES files? IGES file, a step file, a, 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 an inventor file, these are all valid file formats. They just don't work in this program. They work in another program. But it's all software, right? Why can't we just tell it to work? Let me show you what I mean, because this is a little bit crazy. I'm going to insert a component here. And the component I'm going to insert comes from a supplier. And that supplier is using Inventor. Now I can't comment on their their choice of software, but I know that I need to bring this into my assembly and make sure it's going to work for what I need it to do. Open up this battery pack. Now normally what I would do is open it. I would convert it to a SolidWorks file. I would save it, and once I saved it, it would automatically. Um, uh, create a brand new file, which is effectively a duplicate of the original, right? Well, now I don't have to do that. I don't have to create that duplicate. That guy right there is an inventor file. In fact, if I look at my file extensions, this is a .iam and these are .ipt files. If I change my transparency, you can actually see the batteries inside this thing. I just inserted an inventor file without converting it into my assembly. Now I've got to kind of start working around it. Let's say that I want to uh, made it up into place. I click on the part and look at my breadcrumbs. My standard planes are all here. Front, top, right, origin, everything is ready to be used to position this in place inside my assembly. Now I'm going to use a, a command that we did last year called the component preview window but it makes it a little easier to make this in place because it allows me to rotate that part in a separate window entirely as I position it. And so this guy slides down right here and it makes contact with this piece right there. And so I'm able to very quickly uh, apply the mates that I need. The last one though is gonna be this bracket. See this retaining bracket right here? This retaining bracket is set up with an in-context relation. And so when I add my mate to position that bracket, you'll see it kind of slides in and snaps into position. So whatever the size of the battery pack is, that's where that bracket will go, and that's where these rivets will be placed. So for those of you that are familiar with top-down modeling, in-context assembly modeling, that's what I'm doing. But it's in context to a native inventor file. Now, what are the benefits of having it be native besides the fact that I don't have to convert it? Besides the fact that I don't have to create a duplicate copy? Well, one of the other big benefits here is that now I don't even have to re-import it if something changed. So I've got these files. These are my supplier files here. And I called my supplier and I said, you know, feedback from the customers and the users 
feedback says, hey, let's bring in a bigger battery pack. They want to be able to run all day and into the evening without having to recharge this thing. So we called them up and they said, well, here, here's version number two. And version number two is the same files as version one, just modified. I go into my supplier parts and I save my new copies of these files. Now I'm going to overwrite those files. So it would be as if I had Inventor installed on my machine. But uh, when I go back to my assembly, when you change a part in SolidWorks and you go back to your assembly and rebuild it, you see it update, right? Well, if you change your Inventor file, you can simply right click and update the model as well. That update will reread that Inventor assembly and you'll see that my in context relations, my size of my battery pack, everything moves accordingly. And so now, instead of it being eight small batteries, it's six much larger batteries, giving us a much bigger pack and a different envelope that needs to be handled. Very, very cool, powerful functionality. So this 3D interconnect functionality is, is actually uh, something that's in every seat of SOLIDWORKS. This is not like an add-in that you have to turn on um, that's only available in premium. Anyone can do this. And you can do it with a Pro-E file, an Inventor file, an NX file, Solid Edge. And the, the one file type that does require an additional license is the CATIA v5 file format. If you have CATIA v5 files, Previously, you would have to buy a converting tool or converting add-in. That is now included in SOLIDWORKS Premium. So if you have a license of SOLIDWORKS Premium, um, you will now be able to import native CATIA parts and assemblies using this same three interconnect technology. Now, I've got a couple of other parts I could bring in here. Uh, one's a pulley, one's a motor, but I want to kind of keep on moving. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that as these components are brought in, they are not converted. They're simply inserted. And if you do a pack and go, it's actually really funny. You'll see the .ipt, .iam files and everything there uh, along with it. I do want to show, I'll do one more real quick. And that's this drive motor. And the drive motor uh, has a, a, a plate on it that needs to be modified. So this hole right here is not where it needs to be. And so in order to make a change to it, what I can do is actually break that link. And, and so this, this importing of a part as a native file doesn't have to stay native. It can actually be broken and becomes a, a regular SOLIDWORKS file with native part files. Or in this case, I can break just individual parts. And then those become these imported bodies. So for those of you that are, that are familiar with the old way of doing things and you like that dumb imported block so that you can come in here and make changes to it, no problem at all. That's still a possibility that's still very easy to do. You can also do master model techniques where you take a part and you bring it in to another part and it becomes kind of a tool part. So if I open up a Pro-E um, pulley here, you'll see that it brings it in as a part inside of another part. So this is top-down modeling and master model techniques. All right, so kind of moving on to see what else we can do with this. Uh, I actually took something, uh, took this, this 3D interconnect functionality and took it a little bit a step further, and I created a chessboard. Now, if you've ever been to GrabCAD or anything like that, uh, you know that there's a lot of people that create really cool parts and components. And so what I did is I went and downloaded a chess piece from every manufacturer part file format that was supported. So for instance, I believe this uh, Rook or this, uh, uh, yeah, this, this, this Knight is from Pro-E. Uh, this one I think might be from Katia. The Pawn is from Solid Edge. The Rook is from uh, Creo. Uh, so pretty cool uh, parts, and they're all brought in natively using that 3D interconnect functionality. But when you go to position them on the board, right, you definitely need to make sure it's exactly where it needs to be. It needs to be on the board, it needs to be centered in the place, it needs to be oriented in the right direction. So they've created a new feature this year called 3D interconnect. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is called uh, Magnetic Mates. 
We already covered, we covered 3D interconnect. With magnetic mates, simply grab a part and drag it. And you see all those pink dots? Those pink dots are little magnets. So this is a, a bunch of places on the board where I can attach. And if I simply move this part near that, that space, it snaps into position and grabs it, and it fully defines it. This part is now fully defined in all three degrees, and I can move it. Because it's a magnet. Just like a magnet, you can pull it off the magnet, you can drop it on a new magnet, and it positions it. So I'll go around and start snapping these guys into position, and you can see how quickly I'm able to position and locate all these components. Now, how many of your designs are like this? How many models or assemblies or, or parts do you build where really all you're doing is taking a standard component with various options and just sort of snapping them on according to customer specifications? And the customer says, no, I don't want it like that. I want it two spaces forward. No problem. I'll just move these guys forward for you, and that will be whatever you need, right? But because these are all fully defined, uh, it's exactly where I want it to be. Now this part does not have that, uh, that magnetic mate applied to it, so I'm going to open it up and show you how to create a magnetic mate. It's really simple. So it's just like, uh, it's just like the uh, mate reference that you might create on a part, like a toolbox part where it snaps into position, except it's being built with this asset publisher. And the asset publisher allows you to specify where the ground plane is. So for instance, uh, I want this to be my ground plane, and I want the up direction to be that way. So that when I put this in, and this would work for office chairs and office furniture. This would work for conveyors and uh, 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 storage out on the shop floor. Uh, just about anything that you want to organize can be done with these magnetic mates. But then you specify where you might connect to it. And so in the case of a, um, a chess piece, I'm going to just pick the center of the chess piece right at the bottom, specify which direction I want it to go. So you can see this little arrow here is pointing forward. The black team is going to point one direction. The white team is going to point the other direction. And I add that connector. Chess pieces only have one connector. The chess board has, what was it, 64 connectors. A checkers would actually have two. A checkers piece would have a connector on the bottom, but then if you needed a king, it, you'd put another one on top of it, and it would stack them up. So I'll click OK to finish that, uh, that asset publisher creation, and now when I drag it, it snaps into place, and it's fully defined. The idea is this is a fully defined part. There's no movement left. You can disconnect it by pulling it, but once you snap onto that, it is a fully defined uh, component, and it is exactly where you want it to be. So for certain types of, of models and for certain types of designs, this is very powerful functionality for being able to quickly configure and work with what you're doing. And I do have, if you guys are interested, send me an email or, or contact your, your local AE or your local sales rep. and. Let me know. I'll be happy to share this uh, this assembly, the full assembly of the chessboard chess with you. And uh, if you check out our website, uh, you'll also see that we have a YouTube video of going through the entire process of importing every last one of these file formats, showing you the 3D interconnect functionality as well as the magnetic mates. So I'm going to keep on going through. I'm going to look at some drawings real quick. Um, everybody makes drawings. You have to make drawings. Well, I say that. You don't actually have to. A lot of people choose to, but drawings are really, really old. Um, when you need to make a drawing, a lot of times you're actually going to send them the 3D model and they'll build it off the 3D model. The drawing is just to tell them how many pieces to put in there or, or uh, something to kind of carry along with the part. So they're definitely still relevant. <laughs> In this case, though, I've got a section cut on this part. Some edges are in the background, and some edges are actually part of the cut. I'm going to emphasize the outline. And what this does is it creates a different line weight for any edge that got actually cut by the section. That means that the background edges are not emphasized. It's very clear those are not in the section region, not in that cut region. 
you can adjust that in the document properties to make it thicker or even make it a completely different line style if that's your preference. Now if I go and uh, take a look at this detail view, you'll see that the detail view also has that same emphasis in it, but it also has this circle. So you can see the detail, the, the, the default behavior on a detail is wherever it cuts the geometry, it shows the shape of the cut, whether that's a circle or some other shape that you created. Well, we have an ability now in this release to say no outline at all. It completely removes that outline. It's great if you're trying to show the detail of a feature that's on maybe a plate, and if you do a detail, it shows the circle of the detail cut, which really is nothing. It's just the plate. So by saying no outline, it really cleans that up. You also have the ability to do something called a jagged outline, and you'll see it kind of creates that, that torn paper look uh, to make it obvious that that's not a part of the geometry. That's just there for the illustration in the drawing environment. I've got uh, a, a note that I want to create here. And this note for these screws, I want it to show what the screw is, what it's called, and how many there are. Now, normally I would do a link to custom property, right? I'd link to the part number. But what about the quantity that's in this bill of materials? Well, to make it a little easier to not only grab those properties, but also to link other information from the bomb, you can now directly in the notes link to table cells in your bomb. Link to table cell and then simply say I need two. Notice I click the cell and it drops in the value. I'll say 2x and then a space and then I'll specify the part number, pan crosshead M5. And now that is linked to the bill of materials. Now a couple things here. If I grab another bolt and add another bolt, that quantity will update. If I change the, the description or if I actually just come in here and manually adjust it, you'll see that the bomb updates, but so does that note, even if it's a manual override. So a very powerful tool there for being able to quickly create your notes. Now here's one that, that I always fought with whenever I had to work with other people on my drawings. I've got the title block that I want. It's got my logo. It's got the, the custom properties mapped the way they're supposed to be. But when I go to the second sheet, you'll see it's not done, and they did not use the right title block. I'm missing the logo. In the case of sheet three, I have no idea what these people were thinking. These sheets are obviously not the right sheet format. I mean, they're, they're, they're epically cool, and I would love to have this as my sheet format, but I'm going to need to change these from Keith Stone and Chuck Norris back to the company standard. But I've got so many sheets to deal with, they've made this sheet properties dialog a whole lot simpler to work with, and it's a lot more powerful. When you go to the sheet properties to change, let's say, everything from first angle to third angle, or change the sheet scales, or change the sheet format, pick what you want, but then you get to choose which sheets to modify. And I can just one click, say, collect all sheets and apply those changes. And now every sheet has the title block of my choice. Great if your company is updating title blocks. Maybe your company logo has changed or your ownership has changed. It makes it super quick and easy to take even the largest drawing and apply the custom properties and the title block information routinely and, and, and uniformly across all components. Another thing you might want to do with your drawings is to do inspection reports. So there's a tool called SolidWorks Inspection. And with SolidWorks Inspection, you have the ability to take any drawing file that you want and actually turn it into an inspection report really quickly and easily. Let me show you how this would work on this design. I've got all my notes. I've got all my, my uh, uh, dimensionable objects in there. And I'll simply create a new project. And I can link up the part numbers and the part names and the revision and everything to the custom properties. But what I really want to show you is the ability to lock these balloons and automatically capture all characteristics. By clicking OK, boom, it just automatically balloons every item on the sheet. Now, when I'm ready, if, I, if this is all ready to go, I have to simply hit Export to PDF 
and I get a ballooned PDF that can be used, and then I hit another button to export to Excel, and then I have an Excel spreadsheet that's got all those fields in there where I can actually take measurements and write them down, and they correspond perfectly with that ballooned drawing. For anybody doing first article inspections, this is so powerful. It's going to save you a tremendous amount of time. But as things change, over time, you may decide that this dimension right here is not one that you can dimension. Right? It's to a silhouette edge of a, of a fillet on an internal blind corner. The guys out in the CMM shop just started laughing their heads off when they saw that that's the dimension you wanted them to measure. So you go in and you say, OK, don't dimension that one or don't measure that one. Let's just turn that one off. Now, it doesn't renumber the others because they've already programmed their CMM for 25 to be that dimension. So you simply skip the number 24, really simplifies and cleans up a lot of that. If I was to delete one entirely, that deleted dimension would be uh, shown here in my uh, uh, inspection report. And I can simply rebuild it and incorporate that. Or if I wanted to, I could add additional dimensions. And those additional dimensions would be incorporated and included into the export. Now, that's a, that's a kind of an automatic way to approach it. Another way you might want to approach it is a situation where you're doing a first article inspection for just one segment. This is a complicated part. It's going to require very, very uh, uh, different sets of operations, and it's going to require inspection at each step. So to do my inspection project for this part, all I would do is tell it that I want to do a manual extraction of these various balloons. And so when I come over here to actually start picking up these components, it's very easy to just say add characteristic. And when I click the dimension that needs to be added, it gets ballooned on demand. If I want, I can grab a couple of them with a box select, and it's going to go through and balloon all of those. But it really streamlines the already efficient process of adding uh, uh, dimensions to an inspection report and gives you even more control over being able to get what you need, organize it the way you want, and keep everything consistent from component to, from uh, uh, revision to revision on that sheet. Now, uh, one more quick one on this one. I forgot to show you this. This this wrist assembly that I made this drawing for. The wrist itself has a left hand and a right hand version. Now, normally I would call them as shown and opposite. But because we're literally talking about human hands, left hand and right hand seems more appropriate. So you can come in and mirror this drawing view. So see how it's opening to the side here? If I check mirror the box, uh, it will flip it to the other side. Not only does it flip that view, it also flips all the downstream views and relocates the sections and everything else, maintaining everything exactly the way you want it. You can mirror it vertical or horizontal. So if you don't need to create an extra 3D model for that mirrored version, it's possible to just mirror the drawing view and get the result that you're looking for. I'm also going to do uh, something called a model-based definition. Now, model-based definition, I'm going to kind of run through a really quick example. Model-based definition allows me to dimension and document a part without ever actually creating a drawing. Because if you think about it, a drawing itself is, is not a, um, let's see, I'm going to open this guy up. The drawing itself is not really that important or that in useful. It's a piece of paper. It's necessary because people can't read 3D models. It's necessary because you can't specify the material or the finish or the tolerances in a 3D model the way you can on a piece of paper. Well, with model-based definition, the idea is we create the same information we would create on the drawing, but we do it in a digital format. And we do it in a format that's easy for the end user to consume. So when I create a drawing, what I'll do is create a front view, a right view, maybe an isometric view, maybe create some views with notes, and in, in this model-based definition, you do the exact same thing, but you don't have to leave the 3D environment. So this is where I would create a drawing for this part. And you'll notice this is just SOLIDWORKS. 
I can actually build the drawing as I go if I want to, and I don't have to wait until the end to create a completely separate file to document all of my information. Now, some of these have notes on them, just exactly like you would have on a regular uh, drawing. This one happens to have a whole pattern, and I want to go through and create the dimensions and tolerances for this whole pattern very quickly. So for this, what I might do is create a uh, auto dimension scheme. Now these dimensions, if they come in with the features, I can show those dimensions. But in this case, I just want to specify that all these holes get dimensioned. I click one hole, it grabs all the holes, and then gives me full dimensioning and tolerancing for all those components. It even throws out the datums and gets everything cleaned up. Notice too, this is all green. It's showing me from just this graphics view, shows me which faces and which features are fully defined. So if I have any features in here that maybe are underdefined uh, or not yet defined, then they won't show up green. They'll show up yellow or just the part color. So like, for instance, these holes right here, I come over and I can do another auto dimension scheme to specify those. And I'll just reuse my same datums that I used previously. Pick one hole, and it grabs all of them because it recognizes them as patterns. It recognizes them as similar features. Now, you don't even have to build them as the same features if you don't want to. Now, if I go back to my front view, you'll see those dimensions are still there. Those dimensions got added to the appropriate views, the appropriate locations. Everything's spaced out fairly well. If I want to add additional dimensions, I have complete control over how this is all built. So I can do a basic size dimension to specify some of the sizes on these arcs. I can also do a dimension to show how big these tabs are. And normally in a, uh, a 3D geometry model like this, normally you would have to go in and actually pick face to face because that's what an actual full representation is of that, that 3D distance. Well, it now lets you grab edges, and it just defines those as faces. Um, so in this case, I grab this, this uh, dimension. If you can see, it shows very clearly that the top and the bottom face is uh, 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 the what is being dimensioned here. So if you ever create a drawing and you have leader lines and, and you know uh, uh, extension lines that are extremely close together, it's very difficult to tell which face or which edge it's applying to. By clicking that dimension, it makes it obvious where it's being applied to. Uh, I am recording this, and everyone on this on this webcam or on this uh, session will get a link to this recording. Uh, when it's done, we'll put it up on our website as well. So I've got these dimensions in here. Now this would normally would be where I would have it on a drawing and I would print it to maybe a PDF so I could send it to the machine shop. Well, what I want to do though is I want to publish this to a PDF, but I want it to be 3D. I want to publish it to a 3D PDF. And this 3D PDF, I can say, which views do I want to push out? Now on drawings, usually you don't get that, right? You just say, I want the whole drawing, even if not all of it's relevant to whatever I'm trying to do. You get to choose which ones to kick out. You get to choose what title block or sheet format you want. And this is completely customizable. We have a very nice uh, interface for being able to modify and move things around, very much like you would inside of a drawing. You can specify the accuracy. So if this is a really big assembly, you can drop the accuracy down so you don't create some 80 megabyte PDF file. Uh, you can even use a lossy compression if you want that's really going to eliminate the ability for people to pull accurate data off of this thing if intellectual property is an issue. You can attach files to this thing. So this one has a vendor approval form that needs to go along with it. Anybody who builds this part, I've always got to make sure they have this form filled out or maybe some terms and conditions or something like that. I can attach that inside the PDF. I can also create and automatically attach a step AP242 file. Now I've got one of these already generated. I want to show you what it looks like because it's pretty awesome, pretty unbelievable. Here is 
actually I must make sure if this is the right one here. This is what you might expect to see when you open up this drawing. Oh, no, this is not the right one. This is the one. When you open up this PDF, and by the way, PDF, everybody has PDF. I saw some statistics, some 98% of computers worldwide have uh, an Acrobat reader on and installed on them. So this is the PDF that I kicked out. Uh, on the two pages, there's two pages here. The first page is just a notes page. The second page is where I have the 3D views. Now this beats the heck out of any kind of a flat, two-dimensional PDF that you're pulling off of a SOLIDWORKS drawing because they have full 3D viewing capabilities. If they click a dimension, it highlights the faces that are involved in that dimension. So by clicking on these holes, you can see I'm dimensioning from this front face to the first hole in two positions, top and bottom. Very clear what's going on. All my other views, including the flat pattern views, are here. If I have any notes or any information, any markups that I need to do, I can actually put those markups in here and save it. You know, this looks good, but we need to talk about finishes or something like that. I can save that. It doesn't just get lost, and I'm not sitting there faxing back and forth notes. I'm actually having threaded conversations inside the PDF. And you remember those PDF uh, attachments? There was the attachment of the vendor approval form, but also that step file. Now, the step file, I do this a lot. I send out a step file when I have somebody wanting, I'm asking somebody to create a, a, a machine part for me. And when I kick out that step file, I specifically do it to, um, to, uh, uh, to give them something geographic or geometric to open. But in a lot of cases, what you really want is to create something that has dimensions in it too. Right? That's why you always create a drawing and send a step file. But check this out. That step 242 file that I saved, that I created, step 242 includes the ability to add annotations. So that same 3D PDF with those same three-dimensional dimensions and tolerances and notes and everything else, that information in the step file is visible. So I can bring this into some CAM software. I can bring this into my, my laser cutting program to program it up. And I know what the basic dimensions are, so I know whether I'm in, whether I'm in the, the right scale or something like that. And I can also look at some of the tolerancing. This is in eDrawings 2017. You can open up step files of any format, but you can also open up uh, formats such as Inventor. So here is an Inventor assembly. Remember that battery pack that we inserted earlier with the 3D interconnect functionality? You don't have to have a native SOLIDWORKS file in order to open up something, a CAD model, inside of Inventor. Just grab it. You can open it up. You can change transparency. You can make measurements on the batteries. Look how easy it is to interact with this native file that is not a native SOLIDWORKS file. So eDrawings in 2017 has seen a huge improvement. Um, there's also one other area that eDrawings has seen an improvement, actually two. Uh, if you have Google Cardboard, these these virtual reality glasses. With those virtual reality capabilities, the, the app, I don't believe it's live yet, but I'm going to look for it. Uh, once it's live, you'll be able to put your 3D models on your cell phone and then get inside of them and look around them with one of those virtual reality glasses. Uh, pretty amazing, the capabilities of, of what we're able to do with these 3D models to interact with them. I'll even take it one step further. Here is, uh, let me, got to get this dialog out of the way here. There we go. Here is a PDM vault. Now, PDM Professional has seen some big improvements in 2017 in terms of performance, scalability, um, capabilities such as latest version overwrite. We can write and read from PDFs. Uh, we have a lot of new types of tasks, such as kicking out MBD, model-based definition files. But the one that I love, that I think is just so amazing, in this web viewer, you can now oh, I logged out. You can now go in and preview in 3D the uh, uh, the e-drawings files. 
So here is the preview tab inside of PDM. And in this browser, I click this little e-drawings button, and it actually shows me in 3D in the browser this gearbox. This doesn't require a plugin, guys. This this can be sectioned. This can be exploded. This can be interacted with very easily inside this environment. And this allows people to see what's going on and really make sure they understand exactly what this model represents. Now, one more quick thing about this is not only does it mean I don't have to install a plugin, it means I don't even have to give them the file. Because it's inside the browser, they're just viewing a 3D representation of it. I can restrict download content or download abilities, but still give them full access to the 3D geometry, the data card, and all that other information. So for any of you that have outside vendors, have third-party uh, uh, people that are involved, have off-site people or, or you know, users with computers that would love to be able to access and browse your engineering data and everything about it, PDM is a huge tool to check out. If you have questions on that, let me know. Let's see what else we've got in here. Uh, the last one I really want to show, and then we're probably going to kind of open it up for questions or requests, if anybody has them, uh, is something called Visualize. And I can't even show you guys all of the unbelievable capabilities that are in SOLIDWORKS 2017, because there's just too many. There's just too many enhancements, too many programs that are available today. So if you have questions, make sure you reach out to us. We're happy to help you out. SOLIDWORKS Visualize is a new program that's available in 2017. You can go download it for 16 if you want to. It's just a, a, an additional download and install. But for 17, it's included on the, the media kit or in the download. So SOLIDWORKS Professional or Premium, you have it. Now, the way Visualize works is it's a separate rendering tool based on uh, bunk speed. It's a, a former uh, program that was out there. And what you can do is just open up inside Visualize your SOLIDWORKS model. Or new for 17 is just export from SOLIDWORKS to Visualize. And we have an export simple. So we have an export advanced. Export simple is simple. I mean, it's kind of what you would expect, right? With the export simple, the groupings inside of Visualize are going to be based on the appearance groupings in SOLIDWORKS. Let me show you what I mean here. This, this plastic part has a whole bunch of plastic pieces for the housing, you know, multiple clamshell components. If I go in and I apply a new color, like a red paint, to one of these pieces, you'll see the entire thing turns red. All of the parts that are the same color maintain linkages. So that as any changes are made to any one of those parts, they all get changed. Think of it like a subassembly. But instead of it being grouped by your assembly structure in SOLIDWORKS, it's grouped by the appearance affinity. Now, if I was to, let's say, export advanced, in the export advanced capability, it's going to maintain my SOLIDWORKS structure. The hierarchy, everything's all going to be the same as it was. So I can apply to each individual piece something different if I want to, uh, which is a pretty common thing to want to do. All I have to do is drag one part out here, and you can see the preview shows that it's just going to snap onto one of those pieces, and then I can copy it very quickly anytime I want. Now, if I let's say I make a change to that. Now that I've made these red, and I'm going to make this back guy green here, now that I've made that uh, appearance look cool, I'm starting to render it, maybe I'm doing some animations for it, back in SOLIDWORKS it's possible that there might be a change. Well, there's a nice capability here called Update. And after you make that change, simply click Update, and it's going to push that information back over to Visualize. Um, you can also export uh, motion studies and animations inside here. 
So very cool functionality. And the reason why we have Visualize in addition to Photo View is it's a more powerful tool. It renders transparent objects or semi-transparent objects more accurately. And uh, it does leverage your graphics card. So it's going to render really big stuff extraordinarily quickly with the ultimate level of realism possible. Um, and they put it in a separate serial number and a separate install uh, so that even non-SOLIDWORKS users have the ability to take advantage of that tool. That's about my time. I hope everybody enjoyed the show. Um, we kind of went into a lot more detail into what the, the different features are and how they worked, how to turn them on and off, and what there is to know about them. So uh, the on our YouTube channel, if you go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll see that we're going to continue posting new updates and information on SOLIDWORKS 2017. We also have all of these vignettes are available for you to watch. Uh, in addition to, we will record this this uh, um, webinar for you so that you can get to it. So if you, if you have a question for me and you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at marcus.brown Marcus .brown at mlc-cad.com and I'll be happy to answer your questions. But that does conclude our presentation for the day. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day.